Tonight's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 17. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptise any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptised into my name. Yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is God's word. Well, in the night services now, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you would know we're starting a series and going through 1 Corinthians. Uh, So this is the next passage that we're up to in 1 Corinthians. And let's pray for God's help again before we look at this passage. Our great God, we do need your help. We need your help to understand your word, to learn it. We need your help to live it and to love it every day. And we pray, God, that you would help us now. Please open up our hearts. Please convict us by your spirit. Please challenge us in the ways that you know we need. And we pray, God, that you would refine us for your glory through what we hear tonight. May your word transform us so that you are honoured in our lives. And may what we study and think on uh, be pleasing to you, God. And may everything that comes from your word and how we apply it be pleasing to you. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. Christian unity is a a sweet, wonderful, glorious thing. In Psalm 133, it says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, down to the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. The picture there is that unity is such a good thing. Times of harmony and agreement can bring so much joy, and I know some of the best times for me are when I am united with brothers and sisters in God's kingdom and pursuing that. But unity is often so rare in Christians, and in the world's eyes out there, often disunity is what characterizes the Christian church, and this is so wrong. This is something we need to fight. Jesus longed for unity. When he prayed in John 17 for the church, he longed for unity in that prayer. Paul, again and again, in in so many of his letters, he longs for unity in the churches, and particularly here as well, in the Corinthians, with the Corinthians. And Jesus and Paul, they longed for unity because there is a great danger in division. And you know of the destruction and danger in division as well. In your own lives, the the, the destruction that division causes to families, to churches, to friendships. I'm sure you know the stories from your own life. Churches splitting, families being torn apart, pastors starting to compete against each other to, to grow a following, or quarreling and bickering amongst people that breaks friendships or that causes people to leave churches. And in all of this, when all of this happens, the reputation of Christ is shattered in the world's eyes. Someone who writes about uh, this passage, they say this about our passage today. They say, it is easy to see the urgency of a paragraph like this for the contemporary church, which not only often experiences quarrels such as these at the local level, but is also deeply fragmented at every other level. This fragmentation is both a shame on us and a cause for deep repentance. He's right. In 1 Corinthians here, chapter 1, verse 10 to 17, Paul is going to appeal for unity. 
He's pleading that this church agrees with one another. He longs to see no division in them, and this is something we need to long for in our lives as well. And there isn't a church in history who didn't, didn't need this challenge. There is not one church in history who doesn't need the reminder of unity, and as well, who doesn't need that reminder and rebuke against division and disputes. It's because when selfishness and, and pride and lovelessness so pervades us, division so quickly forms amongst us. And so this needs to change. To understand this passage and to see how this can change in us, I want us to to go through a few questions that I think Paul had in his mind as he's writing to the Corinthians and wanted to answer and show them. So we're going to go through a few questions to dig out the meaning of this passage. And the first thing we need to answer is, why is unity so key? Why must unity be in us? Look at the grounds of what Paul calls unity upon. He calls for unity on certain grounds. He does it in verse 10. Have a look. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another. Paul makes here his appeal on the ground of Christ, on the name of Christ. And this really must be what we call, use to call people to holiness or to unity or to anything in following Christ. The ground of what he has done, the ground of what he is doing in our lives and will one day do in the future is the only thing that can motivate lives to honour God. And already in the first few verses of this chapter, we've already seen incredible blessings that we have in Christ. And this should ground why we have unity together. Particularly, look at verse 9. Verse 9 has just said, God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. As Christians, we've been brought into fellowship with God. We are adopted into his family. We are children of God. And therefore, we have brothers and sisters, those who are also part of God's family. And I think that's partly why he calls them brothers in verse 10, to emphasize this. And we need to realize this because as brothers and sisters in God's family, how could there not be harmony among us if we are part of God's family? Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, shows how what we have in Christ demands unity. It shows this same point. It says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. The point is, if you have tasted God's love, then be joined together, knit together with others as well who have tasted God's love and who are part of His family. And so my plea for all of us tonight, my plea to you tonight is for us to be united to be in harmony with each other because we are united under Christ, our Lord and Saviour. We are His family. We are His children together. We are brothers and sisters who will spend an eternity together with God. So be united. And let me give one other key reason why we need to be united that, that doesn't come here on the grounds of what we just saw in verse 10, but it comes from Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 and following. In this passage, Paul lists several acts of the sinful nature, and so many of them relate to disunity. He speaks of strife or conflict. He speaks of selfish ambition and rivalries. He speaks speaks of dissensions and factions, divisions. And he says all of these are fruit of the sinful nature. And then in verse 24 to 26 of Galatians 5, he says, and he gives this challenge, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. If we are led by the Spirit, then the works of the flesh should be dead and killed in us crucified, verse 24 said. And when we are characterized by conflict, 
by division, by selfish ambitions, by rivalries, as we mentioned in Galatians 5, we're not walking in step with the Spirit. We're not living by the, fear, the Spirit, and in fact, we're showing we do not have God's Spirit. And so unity must be in us because of the ground of what we have in Christ, which we see in verse 10, but also because unity is enabled by God's Spirit. It is something He brings about in us, and if we don't have it, it reveals who we really are. That is why unity is so key. But what is the unity that I'm speaking of? What is unity? Is it this all-out agreement on everything? Is it uh, agreeing on every issue, every doctrine, saying the exact same thing about everything and having a church that just thinks the exact same way on all things? Well, verse 10 shows us more on what this unity is and the unity that Paul is appealing for. Verse 10 here gives three descriptions of the type of unity that Paul is longing in this church. And the first one, he says, is agree with one another. Paul says there in verse 10, agree with one another. The phrase say the same is actually behind this here, this word. And he wants them to be together, particularly in who they are following and in what they are saying about their leaders, which we are going to see in verse 12 more. He wants them to, gr- to agree. Really, he's wanting them to all say, say, we follow Christ. He is the one we follow and not be picking sides and certain leaders that they follow. He wants agreement on this. And this is so that, you see in verse 10, it it connects it, so that division is gone, so that there is no division, and so that unity can form. So that's what the rest of verse 10 says. And so firstly, we're seeing here about the nature of this unity that Paul longs for is he wants agreement in them. Secondly, he wants them to have no divisions. You see this in verse 10. He wants no divisions among them. Division is so wrong in the body of Christ. It is so wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, later on in 1 Corinthians, it shows this, verse 25 to 26 say, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. We should be together as one body, having a mutual concern for one another as members of one body. And because of this, because of the fact that we are joined together, if one part of the body, if, if a, a group of cells over here starts to suffer or is affected, then the whole body should be concerned. The whole body is affected. Love and concern it needs to grow in us. And when it does, division can come to an end. When love and concern for one another grows in us. There shouldn't be conflict in us as part of one body. There shouldn't be separation. There shouldn't be the cold treatment that we might have to one another. Where's the love and concern in that? It's nowhere to be found. And yet, so many so-called Christians at times can treat other Christians like this. But there should be no quarrelling amongst us, no gossip, bitterness, slander, or so many things that we do to pull others down, and all of which breed division amongst us. They should not be amongst us because they they are devoid of concern for one another, and they do not have a love for one another in them. And when they spread through the church, when these sort of attitudes in us spread, when this sort of talking spreads in us, division quickly lights up. And so to put out that fire of division and disunity, we need to stop those sparks of the destructive attitudes we have towards one another and the sparks of those destructive words that we can say against each other. We need to cut out the talking behind people's backs or the talking down of people or the nitpicking at people, the whisperings of gossip that seek to tear people down. We need to cut this out because they are the sparks that cause the fire of disunity. We need to stop this. We're dividing the body of Christ when we do this, and it leads to division. And instead, we need to put out this fire with what? With the water of love and concern, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 12. Concern and love for one another is going to put out the fire of disunity. And as well, we need to cut off the fuel of disunity, which is often 
our words, how we speak to one another, harsh words, gossip, or the attitudes that we've been seeing here. So what's the unity that Paul's appealing for? He's, he's longing for agreement. He's longing for there to be no division among them. And the third thing he says there in verse 10, he says, be perfectly united in mind and thought. Here, Paul's desire, he's desiring here to push them to be united in truth, to be coherent in their doctrine, in what they believe, in truth, and in their purpose. Purpose is behind that word, their thought. He wants them to be of one mind in their understanding of the gospel, which we're going to keep seeing through 1 Corinthians, but also with their purpose and their priority of the gospel. He wants them to, for them to have that as their focus and for that to be the thing that they long for and focus upon. And because of this, because this is the, these are the things that we are to be united in, to be perfectly united in mind and thought and on God's truth, then we need to realize that unity, therefore, isn't always the be-all and end-all in church. There actually will be time for division with certain people. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18 to 19 says this. It later says, Paul says, In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Then he says this, No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Clearly, there, there should be some division in church amongst certain people because there are people in churches who are not Christians, who are not true Christians. There will be those who fail the tests of 2 Corinthians 13, which later, Paul's later going to bring up. There, there, there will be those in church who do not have true belief, who do not love the truth and who turn from the truth. We see this again and again, even with false teachers, who Jude says will be among the church. We see there will be people who do not love the truth in the church. And so unity, therefore, is not an unconditional standard for everyone in the church, but God's truth needs to be the condition for which we have unity upon. God's truth needs to be the condition we have unity upon. Because when people stray from this, unity will break, division will form when people stray from God's truth. Well, here we see in verse 10, three pictures of what unity is like. And Paul's trying to get at the, the type of unity he's longing to see in the Corinthians. But, but this unity that he's longing for and what he's speaking of here, this isn't what's happening in the Corinthian church, is it? We see this in the next verses. And so now he goes to attack the disunity that is in them. And for us, I guess, as we see Paul attack the disunity, this should help us to see the sort of disunity that may be in us at times and to battle against that. And so here we ask the question, what does disunity like? What's the opposite? What does disunity like, look like? What did the disunity in the Corinthians look like? Well, here we see it in verse 11 and 12. It says, verse 11 and 12, My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. So Paul has been given a report of the division among them. People from Chloe's household. We don't know much about these people. But what we do see in them is that they had a concern for unity and holiness in this church. And it's right that they bring this to Paul because they want to see this changed. And we see here firstly that Paul needs to address this quarreling among them. There's quarreling among the Corinthians. It seems that rivalries have, have formed in this church and they are trying to align themselves with their favorite teacher and create different followings. First, we see Paul. Paul, he, he came, he would have founded the church and preached the gospel there. And then we see in Acts and from 1 Corinthians 3, it seems like Apollos later came and continued to grow that church. And then we see Cephas mentioned. That is the, another name for Peter, Aramaic for Peter. Now, we don't really know Peter's connection to the church, but what we see here is these different groups and these followings that are happening in this church. And they hear these people, they're boasting of who they follow. They're boasting of their favorite teacher and boasting in their connection to this teacher and who they're following. 
and we need to check, is this in us? Is this in us? Do we have this favorite teacher, favorite online speaker? We need to be careful that this isn't in us, that we aren't just choosing one service or a certain sermon because of our preferences and what we like in a preacher, just over preferences. We need to check, do we here in this church say, maybe we say, I follow Ian, I follow Nathan, or I follow Will. Do we say this? Do we speak like this at times? Do we choose a certain service because of that preacher and the things we like about them and the preferences we have towards them and then create followings like this? I've heard this. I've heard people talk like this as Christians at times about speakers, about people. And I think this is a bigger issue than we think in the church today because of so much online preaching and online uh, teaching that happens. People can so easily follow a teacher and they can make that teacher their authority, their hero, and then they have to run everything by them. They have to test everything, all the truth that they know by this teacher. And if that teacher doesn't say it, then it can't be right. And they become this hierarchy over God's word in a sense. And this is so wrong and it can easily form in us today. And it's so wrong. And this is what was going on in the Corinthians. But following different leaders, it wasn't the only disunity that was happening amongst the Corinthians. There were other issues. And we see some glimpses of it later in 2 Corinthians. When Paul says this, he says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 20, he says, I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as I wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder among you. Paul is worried these things may be in this church because he has seen them in the church. He's concerned, and, and so he's addressing this type of disunity in them. And this brings the disunity that's in the Corinthian church at home to us because we can so easily have quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, disorder, like Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 12. And so this brings it home to us. We need to be on guard against disunity amongst us too. And Paul wants to rid the church of this. And so in the next verse, in verse 13, Paul here gives a few things, three things to strip away disunity and they should help us to stop the conflict that may be in us. So here we answer the question now, how do we battle disunity? And why is it so wrong? I think here Paul shows us why it is so wrong and why it must be battled. And he asks three questions to show why division is absolutely foolish. It's foolish for God's people. The first question he asks in verse 13 is, is Christ divided? The point here is that we are one body under Christ, our head. We are under Christ. Christ is one and his body, the church, is to be one. He is not divided. What he, what he speaks, his truth, what he teaches, it is not divided and the body is not to be divided. How ineffective it will be if a body is divided. How ineffective hands will be if they do not have feet to take them where they need to go and eyes to guide what they are doing. How can the body be divided? And Paul here seems to be questioning them. How can Christ is not divided? How can we be divided who are one under him as our head? And then the second question Paul asks in verse 13, he says, was Paul crucified for you? Here Paul is quite humble and he attacks himself and the people who are following him and he attacks them straight at the front of it. And he says, he's saying here, Apollos, Cephas, Paul, we didn't die for you. We are nothing. We're grasshoppers. We're worms. Christ died for you. He's the one who was crucified for you. Why boast in people? We have Christ who was crucified for us. Boast in him, not in people. He's the one who was slain for our sin, slain to remove God's anger from us. He's the one who rose again to conquer death and sin. He's the one who was pierced so we could have forgiveness. He's the one we must follow alone. 
He must be followed. He must be boasted in. He's the one who was crucified for us, not people. And then the third question that Paul asks to attack this disunity that is in them is this. He says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, he brings this one up because we see in verse 14 to 16, this was a bit of a problem in the church, and they were boasting about who baptized them. But Paul wants to make it clear, we are not baptized into the name of someone. No, we're baptized into Christ. We're united to him. These people here were saying, so-and-so baptized me, I was baptized by Paul, or I was baptized by Apollos, that makes me great. They're boasting in this. And Paul was aware of this danger. That's why we see he, he says some of the things that he does in verse 14 to 16 and how he didn't really baptize many. Because if he did, people would make a big deal out of it. People were proud. Now, I think it's, it's interesting what Paul says here about baptism because we know in Matthew 28 that Jesus calls us as his followers to baptize those who follow him. But here, Paul says it's not his priority. He says it in verse 17. Have a look. He said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, I find it amazing that what Paul says here about baptism and that this isn't why Christ sent him when we think about what Christ commanded in Matthew 28. But I think we need to realize here, Paul isn't saying that baptism isn't important, but that God was using Paul in the role of, of sharing the gospel amongst these churches and Paul knew there was a danger of people connecting themselves to Paul if they if he baptized them didn't mean that Paul didn't see it as important Romans chapter 6 verse 3 which is a letter that Paul wrote talks about how he assumes all believers will be baptized and understand what baptism in baptism is Paul assumes that in Romans 6 Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 8, we see different stories where Paul preaches the gospel and then the people are baptized. We're not sure who does it, but we see they are immediately baptized after they accept the gospel. And Paul is here. He sees baptism as important, but he didn't really do it. He didn't seek to do it. It seems like it wasn't his practice to do it a lot with many people. And we see this throughout Acts. We don't really, we see no way in Acts. Paul directly baptizing anyone. It's not mentioned. It it never clearly states Paul did it. It seems like it must have been other followers or someone else who was there. Paul knew there was a great danger if he baptized these people and that they could form this attitude amongst them. So it seems like he avoided it because he wanted to point people to Christ, not to himself. The focus in baptism is Christ, acknowledging how we've been united to him in his death, in his resurrection, and how this is the thing that saves us. Not baptism, not the person who baptizes, that's not important. But the picture of what baptism is pointing to, that is what saves Christ's death and his resurrection and our faith in that. And so Paul didn't want to cloud people from that and take from Christ, and so it seems he didn't baptize many. Instead, his focus was on preaching the gospel. And he says that in verse 17. Have a look at verse 17 again. It says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So we see, we've already seen that first part. Paul seeks to preach the gospel, not not a focus on baptism, but we see here how he did it as well. He did not preach with words of human wisdom. And neither should we. We need to watch when we want eloquence and deep emotion and rationale and stories and amazing experiences in how we share the gospel. This is not how we share the gospel. Our human ways of doing things can take away from the power of the gospel. We can empty the power of the gospel when we preach and teach it with human wisdom and when we shy then away from the truth. If we rely on our own means, if we rely on our own wisdom, on our cleverness, or on entertainment to preach the gospel, we rob the gospel of its power. We don't give the gospel power. We don't enable people to accept the gospel through our cleverness, 
by making it more palatable through entertainment. We don't give the gospel power by doing these things. What gives the gospel power? Well, Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power. God through the gospel has power to save. Not our words, not how we say it, not how clever and clear we are in saying certain things. And I think this should really help us and encourage all of us in our witness and enable us to be bold in sharing the gospel because we can trust in God's power to work through it. A guy called Leon Morris, he writes about this. He says, The faithful preaching of the cross leads people to put their trust not in any human device, but in what God has done in Christ. A reliance on rhetoric would cause trust in men, the very opposite of what the preaching of the cross is meant to affect. We need to rely upon the gospel, not on our persuasive words, not on how well we say something or how well we argue something. Salvation depends on God's power to save through the gospel. And that is such a freeing thing. I love knowing that because that helps me have confidence to share it because it is the gospel and the truth of that message of what Christ has done that enables someone to be saved. Not everything that I say and how I say it and my cleverness. So we don't give the gospel power. Instead, the gospel has power to save. But also, I I think here in relation to our passage, it would be good to see that unity gives the gospel power. Why do I think that? Well, Unity, I think, and love gives the gospel power because Jesus says this in John 13, verse 35. He says, By this will all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. And in Philippians, as one example, we see a church united and partnering with Paul and the gospel goes out strong between them. When there is love amongst us, when there is unity in us, the gospel can go out in power. And like we saw at the beginning, when there is disunity in us, then Christ's reputation and the gospel, the reputation of the gospel is hindered. And so therefore, those who cause conflict, those who try to breed division, those who bring about disunity, woe to you because you are emptying the cross of its power. You are destroying the gospel in light of believers because of the division we can bring in a church or amongst us as Christians. The cross can be emptied of power when we rely on our human wisdom, on our cleverness, or when we are not united and showing love toward one another. So, Castle Hill Baptist Church, may we not be like these Corinthians. With this sort of disunity, it's so damaging. May it not come in amongst us. May our usefulness for the gospel and God's kingdom not be destroyed because because of how we quarrel over things. May we not waste our time because of nitpicking and disputing over things that do not impact the gospel. And I often have to remember this, even in marriage. I need to remember and realize that what is this disagreement or sticking at this point and trying to argue something going to bring in light of eternity What will the division I sometimes maybe have in friendship as well bring when I just want to argue something and push something? What does that bring in light of eternity? What good does it achieve? I need to ask myself that. What is that wasted time being divided with someone and arguing them going to bring for the gospel? I wish I would remember this more and remember what does division and disagreement cause and bring for the gospel? Nothing unless we are dividing on the truth and what is right and standing up for God's truth, the gospel. I wish wish I remembered this more in my own relationships, that in light of eternity, it's not worth the argument. It's not worth the division. And so because of this, I have one final question that I want us to ask, and that is, what is going to breed unity in us? What is going to breed a right unity in us? We need it. We need it because we can waste so much time because of our arguing, our disagreements, our disunity, the division that can be in us. We can waste so much time 
and we can destroy our usefulness at times for the gospel going out. So what will breed unity in us? We've seen so many reasons why it's so important. And here I want to just give us four things, which I think we've mentioned and seen throughout, but four things that we need to have in us more and more if we are to see unity coming, come in us, if we are to breed unity in us, and if we are to extinguish division and disunity, we need these four things. And we'll just go th- quickly through them. The first one is we need to have mutual love and concern for one another. We've already mentioned it. We need care for each other. We need to burn with affection for each other, for one another's souls and our well-being. We need to care spiritually for one another. We saw the necessity of this in a couple of the passages that we linked, and we saw it as well, the need for it, because we are one body. We must have concern for one another. As members of one body, as brothers and sisters. And if we were to grow in this, if we were to grow in a a deep, heartfelt love for one another, then that that burning blaze of division and disunity would be doused in us. There would not be disunity if we had a mutual love and concern for one another and each other's well-being. Secondly, we need to be humble. We need to be humble in how we deal with one another. Pride is at the root of division. Pride is at the root of disunity. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 10 says, Pride only breeds quarrels. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. So we need to sever the root of pride that is in us and that is behind so much of our sin and we need to grow in us an attitude of humility. We need to cut off the pride that saturates our lives so often. Thirdly, we need to be selfless. If if this filled our lives, if we were truly selfless, oh, how everything would change, wouldn't it? So much would change. If we lay aside our selfish ambitions and desires. If we consider others more significant than us, as Philippians 2 says, how much would change? So when you have a disagreement with someone, you need to ask yourself this, what is driving your preferences? Listen to yourself when you have that disagreement. Are you just saying, oh, I, this, this, this me, oh, I, this, I want that? Is it all about you? Or are you concerned for others in that? Are you concerned for others and their well-being? Or is it just about you? Or are you concerned for God and His glory in what you're longing for? If if the reason that we are wanting something is is self-driven and all about us, we can be sure we're not desiring the right thing. So many people, they want certain things to happen, maybe in their relationship, in a friendship, or in the church. They want certain things to happen but often it's completely driven by selfishness. And is all you hear when they're pushing that is, I think this, I know that, I want this, and it's all about them. It's not about others, and it's not about God, but it should be about Him. That's what matters. That's what should be driving what we want, what God wants. And so finally, that the fourth attitude we need to have, we've seen that we need to have mutual love and concern, we need to be humble, we need to be selfless, and the final one, we need to be all about exalting Christ. That must be our focus. Not you, not, it's not about your preferences, it's not about what you love, it's about Christ. It's about what honors Him. When we are unloving, selfless, selfish people, self-centered, full of pride, we're going to have disunity. And Christ will not be honored in that, but He should be exalted. This is not right. But instead, if we're humble, if we are selfless, if we do have a mutual concern for one another like we've seen here, then we will have Christian unity amongst us and Christ will be exalted. Christ will be honored and lifted up in the world's eyes from those who look in. So may we as a church, may we seek the selfless humility that Christ had, which we see in Philippians 2. May we seek that selfless humility in us. And may we exalt Him as glorious. May we long to see Him lifted up, not our own preferences, not what we love, but may we long to exalt Christ. And may we do this by a deep love for one another, by a concern for one another, by seeking to be united with with one another, 
and by considering others more significant than ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for history and churches who have had to be taught certain things. We thank you for this church who had to be taught about unity and the dangers of disunity and how to counter that and fight this dangerous attitude. And we pray, God, that we would learn from them, that we would not fall into this same trap. Please, God, guard us from this. And please grow in us selflessness, a concern for others, love, a deep love for one another, a desire to consider others better than ourselves. Grow this in us, God. Grow this love in us. And may you put out the flames of division through this. May our humility and our love and concern for one another do away with any any disunity that is in us. And we pray this for your glory. Amen.